Okay, well, it's good that the kids have vacated. For now. Yeah, well, that, okay, but at your own risk, because today's subject matter is really not for kids. Okay, um, so, you know, hey, they're going to get it either in the public school or they're going to get it partially here today. So, um, but today's lesson, we're, we are continuing along. We are now on, boy, what is this? This is the sixth part of our 10 most common reasons for divorce now. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed so far the series, that it has um, been relatable, as I've heard from a few different people. Um, so typically I'm you know, just teaching the Bible and sometimes it relates, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's just, oh, there's a lot of stuff here, you know. But um, the hope is that this would not only be relatable, but that it would also be instruction and, and help us to keep our marriages tight, you know, keep, keep ourselves together, and then to heal our hearts in the process as this more all-encompassing series goes. Uh, last week, we dealt with what kept a good, we got a nice crowd here today, this is probably what kept the crowd low last week, is that we <laughs> dealt with finances. Um, and, and, not, and it wasn't even about giving to the church, right? It was, it was uh, about how financial tension can bring a ruin to a family. Yeah, yeah number two reason for, uh, for divorces. And we talked about covetousness, which leads to overextending, right? Overextending is debt, which leads to what? Stress upon the house. And then there's this competitive nature with spouses as well now. Now that two people are in the workplace, rather than coworkers scrapping over, you know, who's getting the promotion, now it's husbands and wives scrapping over who gets more of the income and therefore who, you know, more of the accolades, you know. So there's just this this problem that is going on financially with, um, within the home. And we, this is the, the short of it. You don't need everything that you want. I don't need everything that I want. And there's plenty that I want. And in America, we've mentioned this, we have, really, we have all of our needs right. and most of our wants. Right. We really do. I want to say that this is such a blessed country, and yet I wonder if that really isn't hindering us. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like the proverb said, if I have too much, I'll forget the Lord. That's right. yeah. you know, and we don't want to have too little because then we curse the Lord. So just sufficient. Somewhere in the middle. And we are... Whew, this is getting tighter. <laughs> we are well fed. Be content with such things as you have. What the Bible would instruct. Your spouse is not a part, or is a partner. It is, she or he is not a competitor. Amen. Right? This isn't an arm wrestling match between hubby and wife. Um, build your house, as we talked about from the, from the parable that Jesus taught. Build your house upon Jesus and his word, so that when the troubles of life come upon you, and they will come, they're going to beat upon everyone's house, along with all kinds of other troubles, that they don't bring the house down. Because Satan wants to bring the Christian home down. Yep. It's his goal. He can destroy the Christian home. He can destroy Christianity in this country. Mm -hmm. And he all but has. Mm -hmm. And we're letting it. Yeah. Church, we're, we are letting it. Yep. And then we, and this is a side thought, not in the notes, but then we start replacing it with all this pseudo-spiritual stuff. Yeah. All of, you know, and I'm for fellowship, you know me, but just all these things that we do that are always, where, where's the Lord in it? Um, let's get together, but bring Jesus. Amen. You know, let's not be the Laodicean church where Jesus is begging to come in. Right. Stand on the door on the outside. He should be a part of who we are. When we walk in these doors, we should come with him in us, prepared to receive from the Word of God. Amen. Bring him into this building. Let him be a part of it. Amen. So, now we're, we're going to bring this section of the series, Healing the Heart to a Close, the section meaning the problems facing the, the family, we're going to bring it to a close with reasons number seven and one, respectively. Okay? Let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, uh, help us. Help us to see everything that we need to see this morning, Lord. Be with our hearts. We really do need to hear from you this morning. As we open up the scripture, Holy Spirit of God, we pray that 
That ex that's exactly what would happen. We'd hear from you. Amen. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Like I said, this is not child's stuff, but come to that's okay. To just be prepared, right? No, 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 you're they're fine. <laughs> Just, just don't look at me cross when the subject matters. Okay. Not, I mean, all verses of the Bible are good, but not all of them are meant for children. Yeah. Right? Okay, so, but that said, they're your kids. You do with them what you will. So lack of intimacy is number seven on the list. I'm surprised it's not higher, especially when weight gain is number five. <laughs> but <laughs> it kind of goes hand in hand with number one. Uh, so, lack of intimacy. I received an email from a woman. I get random emails from time to time of just people wanting to complain. People I've never met. You know, Why did you start a church? Because <laughs> the Lord led me to. Aren't there other Baptist churches? Yes, they stink. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I didn't say that. That's what I wanted to type. But on one of these random emails I received you know, from a woman, you just know right away, too, when, it's when contention's just coming, right? It's just like there's a feel. It's like <laughs> the email's hot. You can look at it and go, oh, who's this? And so she right away started asking me questions. Are you a pastor who stands for or against sex? <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> We need, we, I need to find out if you're a pastor who understands the intimate relationship. Well, she didn't set, call it that, but they're unclean. And gave me all these Old Testament Bible verses on sanitation. Yeah. Yeah. So I responded with, go ahead and turn to Hebrews 13. I responded with Hebrews 13. We will look at these verses as well, but let's start with Hebrews 13. This is how I responded. And um, I responded with this verse and one question. And uh, I never received a response back, so I'm going to assume that she thought I was the evil man that all the other pastors that disagreed with her <laughs> have come to be. Um, Hebrews 13, verse 4, says, Marriage is honorable in all. Not unclean, it's honorable. And the bed, see what goes along with marriage? Right, right. And the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Uh, that's a different matter altogether. We're not going to go into the details of that, again, for the children's sake. You know what that means, though, correct? Right. All right. So um, I left her that verse and then asked her this question. Are you married? <coughs> No response, because I thought two things when I first read the email. The first thing I thought was, I bet you're not married. Yeah. And the second thing I thought was, oh, if she is that poor soul of a husband. <laughs> <laughs> that poor soul, man. So obviously the subject matter is very sensitive. I will, as usual, not really care. <laughs> so uh, let's just see what the Bible says, and we'll just be uncomfortable together. Amen. <laughs> right, Genesis 1. Genesis 1, verses 27 28. Going to try that again, huh? <laughs> like, uh oh, we better get it. We're going to try that again. <laughs> Praise the Lord, that's funny. Uh, Genesis 1, verses 27 and 28. Dad's like, I don't care if he hears my... I don't know, off we go. <laughs> this is 127 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth, despite what PETA may have to say about it. Amen. So, 
even though liberal-minded thought control police believe that they need to educate our children on these matters, calling it sex education, you know, humans have successfully figured out how to multiply without that liberal agenda for thousands of years. <laughs> it's kind of almost natural. Yeah. Um, and, I, and listen, children are going to have questions. Let them learn it in the home. Let them ask it in the home. The uh, last thing I need is some pervert teaching my children what sex is. So, obviously, even in the Old Testament, God designed a husband and a wife to unify and procreate. He created the system even if the woman that emailed me finds the system to be unsanitary. <laughs> It's so dirty. It is dirty. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a little yucky, but you know, there's benefits. <laughs> the benefits far outweigh the yucky. Let's be honest. Matthew 19. If I don't joke, I will be so embarrassed I'll have to leave. <laughs> like the fat guy making fun of fat people. That's, just got to do it. Matthew 19, verses 1 to... Actually, we'll go down through... Oh, we're going to go down through a number of verses. Let's just begin in verse 1. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coasts of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Praise the Lord, that's what Jesus does. By the way, if you don't know who Jesus is, you can know him today. And he will heal your soul. He'll give you a new birth. You just trust him. Amen. Stop playing religion. Trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. He will grant you eternal life. Boom! Like that. Amen. So what do I got to do? That. That's it. Believe. That's what he's looking for. Verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So, the heart of the Pharisee is clearly on display. He's got the same mind as a modern American. Looking to divorce for any and every reason he feels like it, just because. It's wicked. It's wicked. Verse 4. Can I use that word anymore? Are we allowed to in churches say wicked? Amen. I'm gonna. Verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? The only way to procreate, by the way. Oh, Lord, Lord, help us. We all know this, right? You need an innie and an outie. <laughs> positive with positive doesn't work. Negative charge with negative charge doesn't work. You need a positive and a negative. That's the attraction. <laughs> Don't try telling anybody else. Uh, well, I mean, this is... Listen, and I know we can sit there and go, oh, well, pastor's being goofy. And I am, but at the same time, I shouldn't have to say this. Right. But I do, and yes, a lot of what I say and how I say it is meant for shock value. I'll admit to that, but that's because we're so dead. I gotta sometimes just slap someone across the face with a little bit of reality just to get our attention. So that's why I do what I do. Verse five, and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain, shall be one flesh. So the Mormons got it wrong too. Yep. Mm -hmm. They too shall be one. So in a biblical marriage now, a soul, the innermost person, the innermost being, vows unto a soul. That vow is permanence. Yeah. I'm committing myself to you. I'm asking if you'll commit yourself to me. That's supposed to be the intent of a marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the body, physical, cleaves unto the body, becoming one flesh. It doesn't say one spirit. You know, it's not that you would complete me. You know, it's not that thing. It's one flesh. That's the intimacy portion of the marriage. So you've got the intent of the marriage in the vows, and you've got the benefit of the marriage after the vows. So no milk in the cow before you bought the farm. That was a bad illustration. Verse 6. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. 
What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Don't let someone else come and ruin your marriage, and don't you ruin your marriage. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command uh, to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? So man always wants the excuse. He does. He wants the excuse. I, I understand there are excuses, but I can't push them. I've got to push what God intends. Verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Men and women divorce because their hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Say, well, what about a cheating spouse, Pastor? Well, the cheater has a wicked heart. All of this, all divorce, in one way or another, comes from a wicked heart. Say, well, what if I can't forgive that? Well, Jesus understands that I don't know if I could. I don't know if I could forgive it. But it would be interesting to think from a different perspective, how many things have I done against Jesus that he has forgiven me of? And if I had his heart, just a little piece of his heart, might I not be able to forgive even a cheating spouse? I would hope. And we have no intent, right, I think. Amen. Amen. Verse 9. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso uh, marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So, ouch. Here's an actual where, a case where it actually got harder in the New Testament than the Old Testament law. Why is that? I would say it's probably twofold. The Lord, number one, he, he knows what's going to happen in the future. He knows where a divorce rate's going to be. And number two, I, I would say, well, what's the heart of the Pharisee here? Yeah. The heart of the Pharisee is lawlessness. I know they're all about, you know, follow my, my standards. But when it comes to the keeping of the law, they fell way short of it. Yeah. What, what is the law made for? The lawless. That's what law is there for. The law can never condemn someone who doesn't break it. The law is always there to govern someone who doesn't want to keep it. And so they very obviously didn't want to keep God's intent of marriage, so they were looking for outs and hoping that Jesus would justify it. So what did he do? He came along, he made the law tougher on him. Here's what I'm going to say. Let that, let that preach to your heart, Pharisee. Verse 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife... See, now even the disciples are all worked up about this. <laughs> if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. Listen, if I can't just put her away, I don't want to enter into this thing. That's the disciples now. So everyone's heart's wicked. <laughs> Amen. Verse 11. But he saith unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save, to, uh, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs. Okay, we know what that is? That's someone who can't. Right? Castrated. Uh, which were so born from their mother's womb, there are genetic defects. There are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, meaning it was a torture. That was something certainly that governments did to men. They would do it so that they could not reproduce. That was st sterilization happened all the way back before America did it and Nazi Germany followed suit, which America did it before Germany. Before World War II, do your history, Hitler quoted, of a Virgin he quoted a Virginia law. He said, I love what America's doing in Virginia. They're sterilizing people. That's what Hitler said. So that just carries up. Men did that. And they continue, they do it today now through different techniques, but all the way back they would just, you know, <laughs> which uh, have made themselves, you know, that there's, then there's those that have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive this, let him receive it. So he's saying, so now there are those who just want to serve me, and they've made themselves unable. Not me. It's not, that's not me. So again, Marriage, half of it is a physical union. 
Half of it is. Jesus understood this, which is why he went on to reference how that not many people can lead a life of celibacy. He says it right there in verse 11. It needs to be a supernatural gift of God. It needs to be given to them. Anyone here want to go, yeah, I was given that. Not likely, right? Okay, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is a lead-in. Celibacy is either gifted to you or it is not. And I strongly suspect that it is not. It was for Paul. And he will try to convince other saved people to live as he lived. Um, not because he hates women, as so many commentators like to reference, but because he knows that if, if you're single, male or female, you can serve the Lord with singleness of heart without distraction. Um, and our spouses distract us. For right or wrong, they distract us. Um, verses uh, 1 and 2, to begin, 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So can we just start right there? You're not married? It's good. Don't even touch. That's what he's saying. Because touching leads to other things. Verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. So fornication is... If I, I don't even know why I should have to teach this, but we should just know this. It's intercourse without the vow of permanence. I can marry someone in the flesh, but that's not a marriage that God intends. If I marry flesh with flesh and then walk away with no vow of permanence, God refers to that as fornication. Yeah, verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So now once the vow has been made, there's an expectation of intimacy that God rever refers to as, ready? Due benevolence. A benevolence is a gift. But it's a due one. The husband owes it to the wife, and the wife owes it to the husband. Look at verse 4. And the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. See, pastor, wife belongs to me. Yeah, let's keep reading. Likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. So neither one of you belongs to you. Guys, you're not your own man. Ladies, you're not your own woman, even in a modern age. Before you were saved, assuming you are, what if you're not? Better think about that this morning. But before you were saved, the devil and his world system owned you. That's what Jesus teaches. You're of your father, the devil. And if married in that system, then your spouse also owns you. So a world owns you, sin owns you, a devil owns you, and your spouse owns you. After you get saved, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ... Though free from sin and the consequences thereof, you are now bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. So now you're not your own there either. Yeah. And if you marry in that state, well then you belong to your spouse as well as Jesus Christ. So you are never as free as you think you are, even in America. Our constitutional right now, you're not as free as you think you are. And by the way, just let the politicians keep doing what they're doing and you'll be even less free. Yep. Verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Well, fasting isn't a cuss word in a modern American church. You mean feasting, right? Isn't that, is that a misspell? Was they missing an E on that, Pastor? No, that's fasting and prayer. Then come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. What a curious verse. Defraud ye not, is what the verse says. Seems to indicate then to withhold intimacy from your spouses to commit fraud. Yeah. It's quiet. <laughs> That's the Bible. 
Abstinence in marriage is to be with, do you see the verse? With consent. Both in agreement. And for how long? For a time. Not permanently or for san unsanitary reasons. It's just dirty. <laughs> now, lady. That you got to give yourself over to spiritual things from time to time. And the Lord wants you to just focus in on the inner being instead of all the pleasures of the outward being. Amen. Feasting would be one of them, and you get the other. Then it says, come together again. Why? So that Satan doesn't gain advantage over your weak flesh that is now very hungry with desire. See, the Lord speaks to these things which make us all feel a little bit uncomfortable, especially in a public setting such as this, but because he understands what's at stake. Yeah. All of a sudden, that spouse that feels deprived, man or woman, goes off to work, and in an American society, that's the husband and the wife usually, yeah. and receives a little bit of attention from a coworker. And, you know, a little bit of that attention that the spouse isn't willing to give. Or, as the Bible call it, fraud the spouse has committed against his or her significant other. Again, that's the Bible. So now the defrauded person, the defrauded spirit feels hurt, seeks a little bit of consolation in the co-worker. The co-worker comes with a little bit of wooings. Ooh, you look nice today. Oh, aren't you pretty? Oh, you're... Beware anyone that downplays your significant other. Did you do something? What did you do this weekend? Oh, I went out with my husband this weekend. Oh, yeah? What did he do? What did you guys do? Oh, he did that. Oh, he preached you to those places? Yeah. Oh, see, now you bought in. He just cast out a line and you just bit. By the way, I'm going to let you in a little secret, ladies. Um, men are pigs. <laughs> we have one track minds typically and, and, and until we mature a little bit it's going to remain as such and even old men can be young men so just to help out the ladies that are in the workplace men hear words remember we talked about this women interpret words except in one case men will interpret in one case you look nice today means, hey, there's someone willing to... Mm -hmm. yep. Oh, it's true, ladies. You say it's sad. Oh, that's true, too. Preach, brother. That is, that's the thinking of a man. That's the thinking of a man. At least I got a couple guys willing to admit it. Yeah. Yeah. That, so be careful about, I would say to the, to the ladies, just be anyone. Be careful about complimenting the looks of another person. Save that for your, well, your wife needs to hear it, men. Men, or ladies, your husband needs to hear it. Amen. So save it for that, right? You look nice today. So just be careful. And I know ladies, because you don't think that way, you're just thinking, oh, you look nice. That's a nice outfit. I get it. But you need to just understand how a guy's now running with that. Okay? And so just as a little warning. Uh, the... Body being deprived seeks consolation now in the bed of the person doing the wooing. Lack of intimacy, number seven on the list, now leads to number one. It's the number one reason for divorces in America. Infidelity. If I were a betting man, I'd gamble my left arm that number seven, the lack of intimacy, is likely present in a marriage before number one, infidelity, occurs. Not all the time, but I, in most cases, if I were Kenny Rogers, you'll, some of you will get that. Now, when we think of the word infidelity, yeah, I know, I'm an old man. If you think of the word infidelity, well, you are, what, a month younger than I am? <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, we're both, we'll be old together, brother. Solidarity, solidarity right? 
Uh, when we think of that word infidelity, we usually immediately we associate it with cheating spouse, right? But what's the root of the word? The root of the word is infidel. All right, so that's a word that we often associate with Muslims now, right? I will kill the infidel, right? Well, they, they're using it inappropriately for themselves, but they have the right meaning. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6 and verses 14 and 15. It says, Be ye not uh, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Okay? So, if you're saved, don't marry an unsaved person. That's the Bible's very clear cut definition. Now, some of us got saved after marriage. You don't dump your spouse then. <laughs> you stay with your spouse. That's the way it is. Um, and then you pray for them and, and, and hopefully they will trust what you've come to trust. Yeah. Um, but be not equally, uh, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion, now there's an interesting word, what communion hath light with darkness, verse 15, and what concord, you see all these unifying words? What concord hath Christ with Belial? That's uh, another name for the devil. When you see um, children or sons of Belial in the Old Testament, that means sons of the devil. People who are run by Satan. Uh, or what part hath he that believeth with, there it is, an infidel. So an infidel is someone who is not a believer, in the broadest of sense, right? A Muslim uses that word um, as, uh, for somebody who doesn't believe in the moon god of the Kaaba like they do, right. which is what that is. That's Baal worship from the Old, Old Testament. That's Baal, yeah. the moon god. How about that? Yeah. You, know, don't, you know why the crescent moon's on all the Islamic nations? They don't even know why. Because that's where their religion started. Muhammad. He was a pedophile. Yeah. He was a disgusting person. And I know that that could lead to my beheading, but, you know, I'll be in the presence of Jesus. Um, so, moon god of the Kaaba. We, and we would rightly use that to say, well, an infidel would be someone then who would lack faith in my god, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross at Calvary. Right. So, I get why they use the word that they use. I just believe that their God is not my God, and my God is not their God, no matter what Joel Osteen says. Right. Right. So it's someone who is not faithful to something because they don't believe in it. Think about it. What is infidelity? I'm not faithful because I don't believe in it. It doesn't mean anything to me. What, what did you stand up and say before God and these witnesses? Yeah. Right? Here's just a token. I'll read it for you. I've probably said this, I don't know, however many marriages I've done. Something akin to this. I so-and-so, take thee so-and-so, to be my wedded spouse, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse. That's right, worse. There's some worse times. Amen. For richer, for poorer. Oh, he didn't have the money I thought he did. Well, shame on you for marrying him for that. In sickness and in health. And that can be. You don't know. Who knows what husband or wife are going to come down with one day. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge my faith to you. That's just like a token thing to get off the internet. Which kind of speaks indicatively of how we treat it. That's a traditional marriage vow. My faith, my fidelity to you, to you, forever. Well, I can't live that out in another person's bed. That would make me an infidel unfaithful because I don't believe in what I vowed. So don't vow if you don't believe in what you're vowing. Don't make the leap. So now let's, let's get a little preventative 
advice. Can we do that? And we'll close with some preventative advice, and then I'll let you go home and think about all this stuff, or you know, go get some lunch somewhere, go to Walmart, whatever it is you need to do. <laughs> like your finances, um, your infidelity cannot be fixed in a 45-minute sermon. Amen. And I don't know where y'all are or where you're coming from. I don't know everybody's past. Um, I don't even know all of your presence, <laughs> right? I, some of you are new. I, people I've just met today, even. Um, so I don't. Again, none of what we teach. It's meant. It's always meant to be instructive. It's always meant to give you the truth of the Word of God. It is not meant to smack you in the face and say, "And you haven't done that, so you." This, you know, no. Pick yourself up. Get right with the Amen. Lord. And get things the way he wants them done. So here's a little preventative. For those of you who are thinking about marriage, a little bit of preventative advice for this particular subject matter. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 5. Would to God you had one marriage. If you don't, can't turn back the clock, just walk with the Lord from here on in. Uh, Proverbs 5, verses 15 through 19. No, tw Actually, we're going to look at through 21, but let's just start with verse 15. These verses aren't going to make much sense until you let me finish some of it. Drink water out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountain be dispersed abroad, and rivers of water in the streets. So why are we talking about drinking water cisterns and wells, preacher? Well, let's keep reading, verse 17. Let them be only thine own, those wells, those cisterns, and not a stranger's with thee. Don't let someone else drink out of that. Say, well, what if I want to share my water, preacher? Well, we'll keep reading, and it's not really about water. Verse 18. Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Well, wait a minute. Now all of a sudden he's throwing the wife in there. Because that's what he was talking about. Yeah. He's using a well as an illustration for something greater. By the way, when I do premarital counseling, we talk about the woman's well. So in a, an association of a woman and a well, they go together. Women go, into their, men go to their man caves, women go into their wells. And if you want to know what that's about, well... Good. Yeah, it's, uh, it's premarital counseling. Maybe you've already heard it from me. Probably some of you have already forgotten it. Um, but we're dealing with the marriage. It's supposed to be a fountain of blessing. That's the text. That's verse 18. It's supposed to lead to rejoicing. So you, you go to a workplace, and all you hear are people condemning their, their, their spouses. Tearing each other down constantly. How miserable of an existence. Yeah. You know, I go to work sometime, when you go to work, we might not have been thinking the best things about each other that morning. But we made a very conscious effort, if we were not right with each other, to at least not voice that to other people. There's no good in that. Because then our marriage is just like everyone else. On the brink for divorce. No, we've got something better and we want to let people know that even though our marriage isn't perfect, we are sticking it. I love her. She loves me. We are sticking this thing out. Amen. The minute I start complaining about something, I got one foot out the door. Yeah, right. And that includes churches. Yeah. Oh, amen. So it's supposed to lead to rejoicing. And if the verses uh, reference the wife of thy youth, as you see that, so then the intended audience would be someone of an older variety. Assuming that some years have passed both of you by, and yet, ready, the fountain is still flowing, if you will. We're not defrauding. Do we get it? Right? We're understanding. Verse 19. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her, this is going to be tough, ready? Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times. That's in the Bible? See, you need to get yourself a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and be thou ravished always with her love. So the, I mean, this only shocks people that don't read it. Yeah. It's in the book. 
say, I don't understand. God, listen, God is, if it's marriage, he will encourage it. If it's not, he will very strongly discourage it. So you say, well, this makes us all feel uncomfortable, preacher. Yeah, I know, but it's the Bible. It's not church, children's church material, but it's certainly viable doctrine for practi- or practical material for adult Christians. Yeah. Be satisfied with each other. Love. Have a little satisfaction. Mick couldn't get any, but you can. Yeah. At all times. So meaning as often as you can without the thought of defrauding one another. Enjoy. Be thou ravished always with her love. So again, consistently, consciously ravished. That's the word. What does it mean to be ravished? It's like unto being famished. I'm very hungry right now. So together, husbands and wives satisfy those hungers in an undefiled bed of marriage. And enjoy. Amen. Well, don't you think what you do in your bedroom is between you and your significant other? I don't want to know about it. I don't want to instruct you in it. All I'm going to say is enjoy. Verse 20. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? So if that hunger is not satisfied with the wife of your youth, a strange woman will make herself known. Be warned. Besides the heartache that goes along with the infidelity is verse 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. And he pondereth all his goings. So even if wife isn't keeping up with all your movement and you've been hiding them well, guess who's watching? All your goings. All the receipts you've tucked away somewhere or burned them. All the hotel visitation. He's, he's, he's got it. Logged. God is watching. So what's he going to see in you? Faith or infidelity? Do you believe in what you vowed? Live it out in an undefiled bed. Not the bed of a stranger. Genesis 39. Genesis 39. You know, if we just had the Lord's heart in this. Nothing wrong with, you know, if, if things get a little dry every once in a while, then just put in a little effort to rekindle some things. Get a little romance going. Um, chapter 39, verse 4. And Jesus found grace in his sight, and he served him. He made him overseer over his house. Some of you are going to know instantly what story I'm going to. We're talking about Joseph here. And all that he had he put into his hand, and it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. So he was uh, a ruler in the Egyptian's house. He was given a bunch of tasks to do. God blessed the Egyptian because of the presence of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in his house and in the field. Verse 6. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hands, or hand, and he knew not aught he had. So that's someone you can trust, right? I don't even know my finances. That's my wife, by the way. I don't even know my financial state. It's all in her hands. I can trust her. Uh, save uh, the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. Verse 7. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. There's your strange woman. She's coming along. Joseph's a good-looking man. And she's bored, and the husband's out ruling the kingdom. Home alone, bored, out of her mind. Give her something to do. Verse 8. But he refused. See, he was a godly man and well-favored, is what the Bible says. Right? He said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. 
How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See, it's not even just transgressing against your spouse. It's sinning against God. Verse 10. And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Please, 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 every day. Verse 11, it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. Oh, make sure there's always someone present. Good practical application. Put some safeguards in place. Don't be alone with someone else uh, of the opposite sex that is not your spouse. Verse 12, and she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So now you know the, the rest of the story, right? We know what happened to Joseph. Apparently, hashtag believe all women existed back then too. Because she went and said that he tried to rape her. And the Egyptian believed and threw him in jail. No trial. She lied. Women do that sometimes. Just saying. Just saying. What did he do? He ran. When confronted with temptation, don't flirt with it. Flee from it. The Bible says, flee fornication. Every sin that man doth or doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. I was thinking about this the other day and I added it to the tail end of this message, but regret is very much an adult concept. Children know very little of it and we wouldn't expect them to know any of it because it takes time for our actions to bear the fruit of consequence. So, again, preventatively here, if you're flirting with the idea of infidelity, or at the present, defrauding your spouse for whatever reasons you deem to be credible in your sight, may I kindly say that you're acting like children. <clears throat> and not taking a look at the bigger picture and the future hurt that is coming your way in a way of everyone associated with you. If you abandon the undefiled wedding bed for a stranger's bed I don't think it'll take long before you wake up in a bed of regret so sila when I say that that means stop and think it's a, a musical rest but it is used well to just go stop think about what I just said so where do we go from here we've now looked at thought control <laughs> interesting way to start. We've talked about um, it takes a family. We've talked about what that world and the media is trying to do against the family. We've now talked about the things that we're doing to break down the family. Ten things that lead to divorce. So well, now what? Well now we need some instruction as husbands and wives and parents I think. So Lord willing, I haven't written it yet and I don't know how long it will be but it, uh, the title Lord willing next week will be It Takes a Godly Man. Marriage, I mean, you could have a faithful husband even if they don't know the Lord. So I'm not saying that that can't be. But I can tell you that if you've got, you know, if you're a godly wife, you want a godly husband. And if you're a godly husband, you want a godly wife. Because otherwise, I'll end with this, and I use this also in premarital counseling. Relationships are kind of pyramid-like. And on either end, the spouse, husband, wife, we'll say. And at the top is the Lord. Yeah. The closer we both get to the Lord, the closer we get to one another. But if one's coming close to the Lord and the other is not, you'll drift apart. The Bible says, can two walk together except they be agreed? And the answer is, no. now maybe there's, 
enough sufficient grace uh, as someone comes close, gets close to the Lord and the other person does not, that the godly person will not grow uh, discontent or impatient with the lack of growth. Maybe because you're getting close to the Lord, you'll understand and have patience and love the person who's not drawing nigh unto God and stick it out for them. But I want to tell you that the best time that Wendy and I have is when we're drawing close to Jesus. That's the best time we have in our relationship. And if one is growing closer and the other is not, we have conflict. So I would encourage you all to um, try to grow together, read together, pray together, some Bible time together. And I know it's not possible for everybody because maybe you don't have a spouse that's interested in that. Pray for them. Amen. Don't give up on them. Pray for them. All right, Father, I want to thank you for what you've given to us out of your word this morning, uh, for all the practical applications, Lord, even just in the lives we read about some of these people like Joseph and what he went through uh, and how pertinent it is even today. It's so with the times of today, something that happened 4,000 years ago. Um, the human condition has not changed, Lord. Uh, we're deceitful desperately wicked in heart and in action and um, if anything we're just amping it up here in these last days I pray Lord God that you would work uh, in the hearts and minds of the people here today um, to think about their marriage to believe in the vows that they committed to stick with it for those who have yet to marry but are thinking about it Lord that they would consider everything that has been said today and that the vow would be taken very seriously uh, because you're watching. And Lord, I want to pray for anyone who's in the audience that has not put their trust in you, that today would be the day that they would just submit, surrender, Lord Jesus, I may not know everything there is to know, but I'm asking you to save my soul. I'm going to put my trust in you. And, and I pray, Lord God, that if there's someone there, or someone here this morning, that in their heart, without me looking, without anybody looking, that includes me, but you see, in their heart, raise your hand and say, Lord Jesus, save me. And that, Lord, that you would work in their heart to then share that in whatever time frame that they need to, to be able to publicly say, I'm sticking with Jesus. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Be with us as we go our separate ways and with the uh, Institute classes tonight. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.